What's with this? I know. <laughs> I, I can just like, okay. I love it. Yeah, she's really pretty. Oh, does it? This would have looked fun. Oh, thank you. This is an interesting group of work, isn't it? Ready? Okay, we're Did she get it? No, I'm just trying to get your attention. Uh -huh. Okay. Are they all set? Uh, okay, good evening, everyone. Welcome to the uh, Planning and Development Committee meeting. It's Monday, April 22nd, 2013. This is about 7.17 in the evening. Uh, we have a quorum. Um, the first item is approval of the workshop meeting minutes of April 1st, 2013. Is there a motion? Is there a second? Okay, all in favor of approval? Say aye. Any opposed? All righty. Now, items for consideration. The first one is P1, Resolution 28R13, reserving the 2013 bond volume cap. Staff recommends adoption of Resolution 28R13, which reserves the city's right to issue $7,104,575 in tax-exempt bonds under the bond volume cap allocation. This resolution must be adopted by May 1st, 2013. And that's for action. Is there a motion to approve? We'll move. Is there a second? Okay. And discussion? Anyone? Okay. All those in favor? Aye. Any opposed? All righty. The second one, uh, P2, we do have someone signed up to speak on that. It's approval of a sidewalk cafe for found at 1631 Chicago Avenue. Staff recommends approval of a first-time application for a sidewalk cafe permit to found, a type 1 restaurant located at 1631 Chicago Avenue. That's for action. We have one person signed up to speak on that, Raj Ray. I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly. Yes. Uh huh. Uh, if you'd come um, up, and you have three minutes. Thank you. Uh, good evening, uh, leadership uh, for Evanston. Uh, and could we have your address, please? Sorry. Could we have your address? Yes. Please? Sorry, ma'am. Uh, I live at. My name is Raj B. Rai. I live at 1630 Chicago Avenue, uh, and this place of business is right across uh, where I stay with my daughter and wife. Uh, two things that came to my mind when I saw the brochure is uh, obviously today uh, is one, it's an Earth Day, and uh, so it's a day to plant and not to uproot. The sidewalk cafe is proposed on a, on a, on a flower bed that's existing there, so it, um, obviously uh, it might require removing that. So I kind of felt that uh, that's unnecessary, and we certainly enjoy the flower bed across the street. The second issue is obviously what I was thinking is uh, with the guests sitting on the sidewalk cafe, uh, the service door will be opened more than three, four times to bring food in and out. And obviously that en enhances the air conditioning load. And so we have to consider about our carbon footprint also when we, you know, especially today. <laughs> Uh, the, uh, from a health perspective, what I think is important is uh, that uh, the, uh, there are plenty of flower beds around this proposed site. So with guests sitting on this uh, uh, cafe, uh, sidewalk cafe, uh, the impact on the pest rodents around in the other would be quite significant, and I don't know uh, how the business ownership plans to control that if the city approves that. Uh, <clears throat> Obviously, the other thing that I've noticed uh, being a resident there is that uh, when I walk from my building, which is, and we walk to Whole Food, there's a driveway for Whole Food between us, uh, and there's a huge gust of wind that comes in, and there's a lot of traffic in and out of that Whole Food. And with the distraction coming up just on the right hand side, I'm just a little worried that how, uh, and Chicago is a little different than the other one way street uh, uh, around the neighborhood, which have sidewalk cafes. This is a two way street. And the last point that I'm kind of concerned about is the width of the sidewalk. Our neighbors across, which is the senior citizen home, they actually, I've noticed a lot of them, my daughter interacts with a lot of them, they walk from that uh, home uh, around and to Whole Food. This is for many of them, this is just the walk that they're gonna have throughout the day. And so I wanna see minimum impact happen to them uh, uh, if there's going to be service on both sides, like sometimes Celtic Knock ha has, they have great food, but sometimes it comes in and it's, 
you know, for the elderly, it's going to be a little difficult to maneuver around that. So those are some viewpoints I have for you considering. I hope you consider them uh, in granting or considering this application. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you. Thank you very much for your comments. I appreciate those. Uh, is Johanna here? Johanna. Ah, yeah, there you are, hiding behind the column. Madam Chairman, uh, Johanna Nyden has uh, uh, coordinated this on behalf of the Community Economic Development Department and has a few brief words to, to say and present. So I, I will briefly address, um, I think what I heard was the planter being removed and what we've talked about is if this ever ceased to be a restaurant, we would the owner has agreed to restore the planter. Um, we've also, Alderman Fisk and I met with a representative from North Shore Retirement Hotel and they were perfectly pleased that Ms. Morton was expanding her sidewalk cafe, that this was something that her, that the residents of the hotel patronized frequently. Um, they wished it was easier to get in sometimes, but uh, they've certainly um, welcomed this opportunity. And um, you know, I, w I w don't want to try to speak to the environmental sustainability of a sidewalk cafe, but um, you know, it, it, there are certainly opportunities to implement sustainability. I think you're going to keep the door shut as frequently as possible. Okay. And the windows have air curtains, which my understanding is that keeps cool air inside um, and creates a curtain for uh, managing air in and out. Mm -hmm. Well, also there's a vestibule, and the vestibule helps, uh, helps mitigate that as well. Uh, Amy, could you just talk a little bit about your concept for the plantings? Sure. Hi, everybody. Alderman Fisk, thanks for stopping by the other day. Um, I can address a couple of things. One, the um, right of way. <clears throat> We're actually, there's actually going to be more space uh, available on the sidewalk than the six feet that is currently there and required um, with what we're doing. So I feel one of the most important things about this is and are the people that live in this neighborhood. And we feel so amazingly fortunate that we've got such a great range of people dining with us, including a huge number from both North Shore and particularly the Mather. Um, so Anything and everything we do, we hope um, will benefit the community. In terms of um, the landscaping, we do want to and need to actually remove the bushes um, and um, about a third of the, I think they're boxwoods that are in front of the street. Um, and in my humble estimation, um, they're kind of shabby as it is, and we very, very much hope to create um, a really spectacular environment, which we have done on the inside, including herbs and colorful flowers. Um, we are still trying to figure out um, the, the right thing to do in terms of how we're going to green it. Certainly planters, whether on the tables or around the corners of our space, to really um, designate, you know, kind of market where the seating is, but also to really bring as much of the, um, the green and flowers of summer, spring, and fall that we possibly can. So as I was explaining to Alderman Minfisk when I was first looking for a space, um, the number one thing that I wanted was an outdoor garden. And I didn't, and it wasn't a sidewalk cafe. It really was a garden. And, you know, I finally decided if I really wanted to do this, something was gonna have to give, and that's what it was. So I can promise you that um, the idea of being one with nature, being outside, and really um, being something that is pleasing to the eye is of utmost importance to me. Thank you very much. Alderman Rainey. No, I was just going to mention the air curtains because we learned about that, I think, when we did COI with mm -hmm. the facade. So, I mean, that, that is really a very uh, friendly environmental piece of equipment. Mm -hmm. Anyone else? Any comment? So, uh, Madam Chairman, we had uh, 
and members of the committee, this has been through uh, uh, interagency review. We've worked with uh, the Public Works and Health Department staff, and so it's our recommendation to approve as submitted. Mm -hmm. Alderman Rainey. Um, I'd like to move approval. Okay, all those in favor? Any opposed? Okay, thank you very much. <laughs> all right, we're moving on to item P3 which is Ordinance 38013, amending the zoning ordinance to increase the production limit for micro distilleries. The Plan Commission and City staff recommend adoption of Ordinance 38013, amending the zoning ordinance to increase the allowed production limit for micro distilleries from 5,000 gallons per year to 35,000 gallons per year. The amendment would bring the zoning ordinance regulation into agreement with the city's liquor license classification, which was amended to allow the 35,000 gallon yearly limit by Ordinance 17013, adopted February 11, 2013. That's for introduction. Okay. Um, did you want to comment? Okay. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Okay. Great. Um, Madam Chair, just one yes. thing. Mm -hmm. um, I think I saw on here, it says from 5,000 gallons per year to 35. Is that supposed to be 15? Oh. Did it start out at five? No, I think so. If I could, Dennis Marino, uh, it should be, it's, it should be 30,000. Oh, wait. To 35,000, if I'm not mistaken. That's Wait, from 30 to 35? In February, we did 30, right? Okay. Yeah. For the liquor license. Right. Correct. But I thought, I, I thought the 15,000, 15, the 5,000 gallons really, I don't know. I, I think that's a wrong number. I don't think it what, what, works there. What is the correct number? We'll correct that from the ordinance. Okay. I don't know that it's in the ordinance. I, I just was see it, it here. In the in the ordinance, in, I'm sorry, in the ordinance, uh, craft distillery license which shall authorize on-site production and storage of alcohol in quantities not to exceed 30,000 gallons for one year after the effective date of this amendatory ordinance and 35,000 gallons thereafter. And then it, okay, what, what are we voting on then? Is that 35? We're fo voting on 35, okay. And we started out at five or started out at 15? We started out at 15, 15 as a typo. Yeah. Okay. You're right, Alderman Rennie, it was a typo. Okay. But so it's we're going in the ordinance. It's correct in the ordinance. Okay. So we're going from 15 to 35. Everybody's good with that, right? Okay. 15, 30 to 35, right. Okay. Did we, did we vote on this? Okay. Did we? Yes. Okay. <laughs> well, let's vote on it again. All those in favor? Let's do it again. Yeah. All those in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Okay. Our now apologies. we've got it. Oh, that's okay. Now we've got it right, though. Okay. We're not leaving committee till we have it right. right? <laughs> okay. Item number P4 is Ordinance 47013, amending the zoning ordinance to allow indoor recreation as a special use in the I-2 district. The Plan Commission and City staff recommend adoption of Ordinance 47013, amending the zoning ordinance to allow indoor recreation facilities as special uses in the I-2 district, as well as modification to remove the term commercial from the zoning definition so that non-commercial entities may establish such use. That's for introduction. Is there a motion? Is there a second? Second. Okay, Alderman Rainey. Um, I oppose the removal of the term commercial. Um, this, and I'd like to speak to why I oppose it. I fully support indoor recreation, have no problem with that being in an I-2 district. I think it's an opportunity. Um, but to take, that's my calendar telling me city council. Or, sorry. <laughs> sorry. Um, to, to take an I-2 district after we have just been through a long, arduous lawsuit over the issues involving I-2 districts, we don't even know the results of that yet, to take and make it possible for a not-for-profit or non-commercial property tax exempt use, other than those that are currently permitted or by special, to be in an I-2 district is to really a knife and undermine the tax-based problems that we have in this community. The tax rates in I-2 districts very high. They're very lucrative. Once you get a property in there, very lucrative. 
And I, I really object to uh, eliminating the word commercial because to me, eliminating the word commercial allows for not-for-profit tax-exempt properties. I don't care if a not-for-profit who pays taxes goes there, but I don't want to have to go through the rigmarole of a special use, fighting with them, well, how much can you pay? Are you going to just pay the 20% that the city gets on the tax bill, or are you going to pay the 100% from all the taxing bodies? So I, I object to it, and I would like to move to delete the omission of commercial in an I-2 district. For for a sports indoor sports facility. Okay, um, you're making that motion, Alderman Rainey, yes, for an amendment. Yes. Okay, so it's been moved and seconded. Um, is there anyone who wants to speak to that motion? Alderman Wilson. I didn't expect the objection, so I'm a little, I'm, I'm still processing it. So, I just want to talk it through a little bit. I guess, the, well, the, <laughs> one, of the, one of the difficulties I have is, for the most part, a lot of these um, sports-oriented organizations are going to be non-commercial, you know, the, the, the leagues and things of that nature. So um, they're not going to be in a position to put it in a different type of area. They're going to have to go to these I-2 types of areas. And I think it's, you know, the, you referenced the other litigation that's, uh, that's currently pending that involved a school a recreational use is very different than a school use, I, in, in, in my estimation. I don't so. object to the use. I love the use. I love the use. I, my only objection is property tax exempt <coughs> uses, I, property tax exempt entities. I think, uh, if, Madam Chairman, if you permit us, I think um, we didn't anticipate th th this coming. I think if the issue is, I, I don't know what else a nonprofit um, could go into. I think it's if it's more a tax question, uh, perhaps Dennis uh, could address. Yes, uh, thank you, Steve. Um, in looking at this issue, really the evolution of this uh, requested text amendment was um, a reference from Alderman Braithwaite um, and uh, also really two projects involved, potentially two potential projects. One is a, a private entity uh, on a parcel uh, along Oakton in this district that wants to do an indoor recreation facility uh, with a number of not-for-profit <coughs> clubs and associations making use of that. Uh, the other uh, contemplated use that approached us uh, related to this was um, the Team Evanston um, Soccer League Club, if you will, that was very interested in a site on Dempster. Uh, and in neither case was there any discussion or representation of intent to be tax exempt or anything like that. Um, so the way this text amendment is structured is um, it, it basically, staff recommends that these be special uses. Uh, eligible special uses in the I-2 district. Obviously, it's up to the discretion of city council when an application comes forward as to whether or not you approve that or if you approve it under what conditions. Um, but the intent here is, is to be encompassing in terms of uh, certainly the two entities that have uh, very current plans for moving forward. Um, but again, no discussion in, uh, in terms of any tax-exempt aspects of this. The word eliminating commercial, it, it's pretty obvious why it's being done, and I'm just saying that that is the one objection I have. I have no objection to the use. Indoor commercial recreation, indoor uh, recreation, <coughs> fine with me. I think it's a great use. Um, and there is absolutely no indication, and I think you sort of glossed over this, that the project on Oakton, should it ever come to fruition, is going to be off the tax roll. It's a pri uh, it's the only reason I'm supporting it. It's a private, for-profit project uh, behind Gordon Foods if it ever gets off the ground. So that's that's not going to be um, off the tax rolls. But if a you know a not-for-profit, which is more or less uh, the the opposite of commercial. 
uh, goes in, it, it will apply for a tax exempt status. In an I-2 district, I think that is objectionable. And Alderman uh, Wilson, I don't see how you can support removing hundreds of thousands of dollars from the tax rolls when you will not support financial incentives to tax paying entities. I mean, isn't that, that's a little hard to explain, I think. And so I am simply saying, let's pass this, let's introduce this, eliminating the, the uh, deletion of the word commercial. This came to us from the plan commission asking us to eliminate or delete the word commercial. I'm saying let's not do that. Alderman Wilson. Well, and I'm, I'm just trying to, I haven't read it through without, without that, reverting back to what you're suggesting we should leave it. In other words, I'm not sure what the impact of leaving the word commercial I just need to read it through I mean there's 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 a, a dozen references what do we have next on the list here maybe you should with maybe you should hold it I don't, I don't necessarily want to hold it I just need like five minutes to read it so um, but as, as mr. Marino mentioned I, I don't think there's been any discussion about taking it off the tax rolls I understand your point I see what you're saying now that you mention it, but I'm just trying to determine if the language change you're mentioning accomplishes what you're suggesting. So why don't we just go to the next thing, and I'll kind of read it as we could we could we pass it till after sure. P five. Uh, yeah, I have a question for Mr. Cox. Um, could you just um, again remind everyone who's listening the um, definition of the word commercial, and whether that word is directly tied to the payment of property taxes? Uh, good evening, Madam Chair and uh, members of the committee. Ken Cox from the city's law department. Uh, the term commercial itself is not a defined term in the zoning ordinance. The closest definition therein is commercial purpose, which is in uh, section 618.3 which is defined as an occupation, employment, or enterprise that is carried on for profit by the owner, lessee, or licensee, except for activities carried on by a not-for-profit organization that utilizes the proceeds of such activities solely for the purposes for which it is organized. Okay. Not sure that clarifies I think anything. So in other words, a nonprofit that uses the money, like the fees it charges the participants, for its own operation, that would still be considered commercial. Is that what you're saying? I hesitate to, to answer in the theoretical, but um, I, I think there could be there could be circumstances in which such an activity would be deemed a commercial purpose according to that specific definition. Right. I mean, if you read the nonprofit sentence again, you read it through quickly. Just allow us to process it a little. Sure. Um, activities carried on by a not-for-profit organization that utilizes the proceeds of such activities solely for the purposes for which it is organized. So if you have a soccer league and they charge you fees to participate in the soccer league and they use that to operate the soccer facility, that would still be commercial? By that definition, yes. Right. So I, I guess yeah. that it, it doesn't really, that's kind of what I'm getting at, is, is your suggestion doesn't change anything other than I, for those who are supporting this project on Dempster, what was the reason for removing the word commercial by the Planning Commission? There's a reason for this. The implication is clearly here, mm -hmm. clear. Mm -hmm. Whether or not Mr. Cox can, I mean, I am certain if you had a Salvation Army store in an I-2 that didn't collect <coughs> Uh, that didn't have to pay t property taxes but sold clothing, that I guess that would be commercial. But they would still be tax exempt. So my issue is that this implies not for profit, commercial. There's no reason, what in the world was the reason for them removing the commercial? Well, I, th I think it's just uh, my assumption, I didn't write it, I'm just assuming, and when I read it, I assumed that it was an intuitive assumption 
that soccer leagues like was it Team Evanston that's making the application? They're not a commercial operation. They're not charging people to use the facility, generally speaking. They probably would do better to, if they to did. blanket so. all I-2 districts because we have one user who wants to go into one property flies it also in the face of economic development in this town. I think if, if you think of it in the reverse, let's say... It's hard to argue. No, I mean... I, I don't care one way or the other, frankly, because I, I think that it doesn't, if we take, if we leave the word in, it doesn't have any impact on what the applications are asking for. So I, I, I think to, what I'm trying to point out to you is that you're not fixing your problem. So I'm just drawing that to your attention. The, the problem exists when the Zoning Board of Appeals mm -hmm. or the City Council gets a not-for-profit user in an I-2 district and says to them, uh, Okay, go ahead. You can, you know, you you can be an indoor recreation facility. Then it comes to us, and we say, wait a minute, you're not going to pay any taxes. <clears throat> this property was paying two hundred thousand dollars empty to on the tax rolls, and now you're removing it. Two hundred thousand dollars is a huge hit for the schools, and ten percent, twenty percent of that is a huge hit for the city. So I think we have a real issue here with a new not-for-profit use in an I-2 district. That's all I'm saying. Because these places vacant, unused, are playing, paying large tax dollars to the taxing bodies. I don't have a problem if you leave the word commercial in. Okay, I don't, I don't have a problem leaving the word commercial in. Leave it in. And then the okay. individual users can come and argue right. their case. Um, is there any more discussion? Okay, so um, we need to vote. On yeah, we. Need, I, I know. I'm just reading it over again. Um, okay, so if you vote in favor of this, you are voting to remove the word commercial. If you vote against it, no, here. No, no, we're no, just I'm voting on the amendment. Oh, I'm sorry. We're voting on your amendment. Delete their recommendation. To approve uh, with the deletion. The Wait. recommendation is to remove commercial. I'm, oh. I'm suggesting <laughs> that you vote is for to put my it back. <laughs> proposal it's to keep that you defeat their recommendation and keep commercial. Are we voting on your amendment? Yes. Okay. We're voting on Alderman Rainey's amendment. All those in favor of Alderman Rainey's amendment say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay. Now we're going to the Sorry. main. <laughs> the main <laughs> motion. Yes, I'm hearing two different things here out of each year. Um, Okay, so the, the main motion is for introduction, um, and um, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, we're all set. Moving on to P5, Ordinance 46013, amending the zoning ordinance to allow yard waste transfer facilities as special uses in the I-3 district. The Plan Commission and City Staff recommend approval of proposed Ordinance 46013, amending the zoning ordinance to allow yard waste transfer facilities as special uses in the I-3 general industrial district. It's for introduction. We have several people who want to speak. Uh, did staff want to make a presentation first? Yes, Dennis. Okay, Dennis. Marina will make a presentation. Thank you, Alderman Fisk. Uh, this item uh, evolved from a uh, request from a property owner uh, in the I-3 district who wanted to operate uh, a facility, a landscaping facility, uh, that would accept, uh, recycled, uh, would accept yard waste and recycle it and other landscape waste. Uh, in addition, uh, the business also would be um, selling uh, landscape materials on a wholesale basis. Um, so as, as best we could estimate, it seemed to be about a 50%, 50% use mix in this regard. Uh, the land is currently vacant. It's in the I-3 district, which is that very narrow strip of land over almost to the canal um, that's west of Home Depot. And uh, the northern edge of it is uh, almost touching the Sam's parking lot. It's where the uh, Ozinga concrete facility is. Um, uh, but staff felt that, uh, first of all, it, there isn't uh, a permitted use category or a special use category in the I-3 that such a yard waste transfer facility would fit under. Um, so in working with the plan commission and the applicant as well as the law department, uh, we came up with this approach. And so staff 
uh, did make the recommendation, as the plan commission did as well, uh, for you to consider this as a, a possible special use uh, within the I-3 district, um, and uh, be happy to respond to any questions. I should also add that Scott Scholler, uh, who is the landowner and uh, a partner in the business, is here tonight, along with uh, another two of his associates as well. Okay, fine. Um, should we hear the uh, citizen comment first? This one. Sure. Alderman Rainey. Would, would this have uh, qualified for a unique use? Um, it's an interesting question. We did not look at it that way. A unique use is something that's not at all contemplated in the zoning ordinance. Um, we do have landscape, you know, uses in town, certainly trade contractors. Uh, we don't have quite the yard waste uh, facility that's described here. Yeah, this is really different. Right. Yeah. We thought that using the special use would be the best approach because in the I-3 district, um, there are some sites that may be workable for this. There are other sites that may not, and that way the city council would have the discretion to make that determination. If it were to be made a unique use, would it be a blanket unique use for it? It wouldn't be. It would only be this one, right? Correct. Yeah, I can only think of one occasion where the unique use has popped up, which was the school district 65 former headquarters. Uh, there may have been other cases before that, but none that I'm aware of. So it's a very, very unusual thing that uh, even would be requested, let alone considered. Alderman Holmes, did you want to say something? For the speakers. All righty. Uh, so we're going to go to citizen comment. We have one, two, three, four, five, six people signed up. Uh, you get three minutes apiece, uh, starting with Colleen Burris, then Clark Chipman, Ann Brownell. Hi, Colleen Burris, 1312 Cleveland. Uh, thank you, committee. Um, I'm requesting that the proposed ordinance amending the zoning ordinance to allow the yard waste transfer facility be held in committee to further investigate issues that may arise from the yard waste transfer, most notably the odor concerns. Um, I've had numerous comments from residents, and I want to. I really appreciate everything that uh, Dennis has done, as well as Steve, on moving this uh, forward to for our consideration. The more investigating and uh, hearing about the odor issues, uh, I think there's just a lot of unanswered questions. So if we can get those questions answered before moving to council, it would be very helpful. So I appreciate you uh, considering that request. Mr. Chipman, are you here? Good evening. My neighbors and I thank you for the opportunity to be here this evening and speak to you. My name is Clark Chipman and I reside at 2007 Seward Street. I am here along with my neighbors to address item P5. We are opposed to a yard waste transfer site in the 13th district. Several years ago, the city operated their own waste management compost site behind the old recycling center just west of the hill at James Park. During that time period, many in my immediate neighborhood, and those as far as the wind could carry, were subject to the obnoxious odor that this site created. Though the city tried hard to contain the smell and address our concerns, the smell still continued to the point of residents being unable to adequately enjoy their yards in the outdoors. Subsequently, the city decided to shut down the site for many reasons, but the initiation of this was the odor complaints. As you consider this text amendment, please remember that once you approve this, it will apply to the entire 13 district, which means if a subsequent landscape contractor or business owner wants to operate a yard waste transfer site in the 13th district, they only need to apply for a special use. Even though it is ultimately up to the council to approve a special use, you would be hard pressed to justify saying no to one when you have already said yes to another. The ability to operate a yard waste transfer site in this district has the potential to create a site as large as the city once operated without true accountability measures similar to what the city adhered to and let's remember that did not work out so well. Although the proposed ordinance regulates the time the yard waste can sit on this particular site as 24 hours, 
it does not go far enough. It also leaves open the potential for longer time periods as it reads, quote, or other time period designated in 415 ILCS 5 slash 3920 as amended. The memo from staff indicates that the time period would be no longer than 24 hours when over a weekend. Imagine if yard waste was dropped off Friday, not picked up until Monday, and the temperatures were in the 90s. I can smell it now. A maximum 24-hour period and no more should be enforced. If this text amendment does pass and the petitioner applies for a special use, then other measures should be considered. Ask yourselves, how large a site waste site should this contractor operate? What kind of cover will be placed over the yard waste? Please consider as minimal an area for the yard waste. Again, we have seen how a large yard waste operation, even though maintained, can emit a far-reaching odor. A more than adequate cover should be placed over the site. Requiring the petitioner, the petitioner to build a structure in which the yard waste can be placed would be ideal. Mr. Chipman, we need to wrap it up. Okay, I've got three or four more sentences. These conditions should be explicit in the special use. If the petitioner does not adhere to it or if the yard waste operations increase, they must come to the council for approval or risk their special use being rescinded. On behalf of my neighbors, if you choose to allow this text amendment, then I ask that you consider measures that would be in the city's control. At the end of the day, we as residents are the ones who will have to live 24 hours a day with the smell or the consequences of any yard waste in this 13th district. Thank you for your consideration. Thank you very much. Ms. Brownell? Ann Brownell, I live at 616 Gray Avenue. I'm also a member of the North James Park Neighbors and was actively involved in getting rid of the uh, composting site that we had by James Park. Uh, in addition to what Clark said, all of which I agree, we had another neighbor who was not able to be there to be here tonight. She's a la landscape contractor and made the point that she would very much benefit from this business. But as a resident in that neighborhood, she's a very much opposed to it. The, it's not only receiving yard waste, but also selling mulch. And some types of mulch have an odor that goes with them. Okay, there's nothing in here that dictates how we're gonna control that. The other point that she makes is the dust. We're less than two blocks from this location and we had smell and dust from the recycling center that was even further away from where we live. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, Al Maris Mariston, am I reading that correctly? Maybe. Yes, sorry. My name is Al Maiden. I'm a director of planning for Rolf Campbell and Associates. Our address is 910 Woodland Parkway, Vernon Hills, Illinois. 75% um, of my work is probably for the public sector. I serve as staff planner, zoning administrator for several of our uh, public clients. And when I was approached with uh, this assignment, 25-30% uh, of my work is for private individuals. I explained to them that I would take this assignment with the recommendation that we work strongly with your city staff, we work with your plan commission, we work with uh, you as city officials, and we work with residents. If there's legitimate objections, we would welcome the opportunity to work with them. Uh, with this ordinance, uh, it is looking at a special use in the I-3 district. The I-3 district already allows some rather intense um, Permitted uses, you have vehicle salvage, recycling center. My client owns the property and has used it for uh, auto storage in the past. 
What he's trying to do is find something that is a win-win situation for him as a property owner and you as a city. And that's what we're looking at for this proposed text amendment. The opportunity to apply as a special use is something that, that uh, they would like to pursue. There is the 24-hour provision, which, by the way, is also part of the regulations from the uh, IEPA. Uh, a operation such as this needs a permit from the uh, IEPA for operations. So this issue of uh, having yard waste for too long a period of time really should not be a, a concern. We want to make it very clear, I've, I've worked on compost facilities in more rural communities. I personally do not support compost facilities in areas such as this that is a, a little bit more dense than what we see in some of these areas. This is not a compost facility. There's looking at one bin covered that your contractors that may be collecting landscape waste from your residence can come drop it off in that one bin, and then purchase other landscape materials that they may also use with your residence as they maintain housing in uh, or residential or commercial properties in the city of Evanston. So from the standpoint of, of uh, an alternative, if this is something that the city doesn't want to pursue, I think the property owner has to look at, well, what other alternative uses can he pursue? And he has to look at some of the permitted uses, which are rather intense. And that's why, again, I think this is a win-win situation for the property owner and for the city. Uh, we'll be happy to work with uh, you, know, you as this continues in the process. So are there any questions? Yes, Alderman Rainey. Are you representing the property owner? Yes. You are. Okay. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Schuler. Is that, am I pronouncing it correctly? That's correct. Okay. My name is uh, Scott Scholler. I'm uh, from Contour Landscaping. I grew up in Skokie. We're located at 3501 Jarvis in Skokie. Um, I've owned this property for over 25 years. Uh, originally used it for outdoor storage and for my landscape business. And after that, I rented it to a concrete contractor that also used it for open storage. I guess the main thing that I want to make clear is the distinction between a landscape waste transfer center versus composting. Um, composting is a whole different operation. We're not going to be doing that here. Uh, we're basically going to be working with Illinois EPA guidelines and we're going to be transferring this material to a compost facility, <clears throat> which is located in a rural area. Um, so I think the main thing I wanted to do was just make that clear, that this is just transferring the material to a different location. Does anybody have any questions for me? Yes, Alderman Wynn. I, I see the diagrams that we have received in the packet, but can you give us an idea of the size of the bin at, that that the um, material that's going to be transferred it will be uh, under your design here? Well, what we would actually be looking at is, you know, after we go through the use, um, you know, the special use permit, the next conversation would be with the uh, Illinois EPA. And um, as far as, um, Al, do we have that down, what the dimensions are on that uh, location? Not specifically. We don't have that specifically at this point, but obviously it would have to be covered. In other words, staying in the uh, IEPA guidelines, we couldn't like, oh, we've got too much material, and then not have it covered. This material has got to be covered. So if it ever got to the point where... We couldn't handle any more volume. No more yard waste would be accepted at that moment until we could actually remove whatever we have there to accommodate. So when you say that it's going to be covered, is that covered like with a roof or with a tarp or what are you? It's with a roof. Okay. Yes. So in other words, um, rainwater and things of that nature 
would not go into that area. It would be kept dry. Well, I know seeing the landscape contractors that we have throughout Evanston and seeing how much they can remove just from one of my neighbor's yards, um, you know, in, in one visit, uh, you know, I'm, I'm just trying to figure out how much space would you would be con thinking about as using it for to hold that before it's transferred. That's, that's what I'd like to find out. Like, for instance, what's a for instance? I believe this gentleman can also give you a little bit better indication of the dimensions, but I just want to say I've, I've worked with some of these in other locations. If it turns out, 24 hours is the maximum. If it turns out that, gee, we really get a rush and there's several contractors that, that, you're, that bin is filled by noon, they make a phone call, they send a truck down, and they empty it. So it's, it's not like, well, gee, we still have another 12 hours left and we're just going to let it spill out from, from beyond that. They'll send the truck let them know before it's full. Okay. I, um, just one second. Um, Mr. Griffin, do you just want to make a quick uh, well, clarification? A, a, a little uh, cart before the horse. In order, he, he cannot wait for his uh, uh, Illinois permit. Our, our special use permit requirements would have to specify how large this facility is, and that would be detailed as part of the application. Okay, Alderman Rainey and Alderman Holmes, I don't know which one of you is first. Okay. Well, I was just following up on, on what Alderman, is my mic off? Yes, it is. Um, what Alderman Wynn said, I'm looking at Veolia and, and the bins. So they're pretty large. I mean, I, I think you have an approximate idea how uh, large they are because um, trucks are bringing them in. So, you know, those of us that are familiar with waste know that those bins are pretty, uh, you know, they're pretty large. They're not just a bin like, you know, they're going to take in a, a dumpster. It's not like that at all. Yeah. Hi, uh, my name is uh, Jim Seckelman, and I'm the owner of the Molt Center. Uh, and we have uh, some different yards, uh, one in Lake Bluff on 41, uh, Deerfield Road in, uh, uh, excuse me, Milwaukee Avenue in Deerfield. Uh, trucks that uh, historically will be coming in this site will be the landscape contractors, and they're probably on average about five yards. Some of them are a little bigger, some are a little smaller, some come in pickup trucks or even a trailer. The garbage waste hauler trucks are generally about 40 yards, which are uh, much more sizable. The bin that Scott and I have uh, kind of talked about, there, there is a structure on site, and roughly would hold about a hundred plus yards. We have trucks that uh, hold 80 yards and we have some that hold 40 yards. Uh, within a phone call, uh, we have trucks all throughout uh, the North Shore and out in the western suburbs. Within an hour or two, a truck could be dispatched and the yard waste taken off. And at the end of the day, it would be taken off each day, seven days a week. Except on, on you operate on the weekend? We do. So there would be no waste left on site overnight? Uh, Sunday, we, we're contemplating whether we'd have enough business there, but Saturday we'd definitely be open. So Saturday night, the material would be all removed because we couldn't make it, and then uh, Monday morning when we reopened, for example, if uh, we, you know, had a, our last load was at 4 o'clock in the day and the truck had just gotten there at 3, that product technically wouldn't have to be removed till the following day till 3, 4 o'clock, if you follow me. So, so it could have some over the weekend. Uh, well, on a, no, no, because if we're closed at 4 on Saturday or whenever we close on Saturday, it would be for Sunday. And if we're not open Sunday, we got to get all of that cleaned up until, so yes, we would be 100% cleaned on a weekend. Um, Alderman Rainey? Those were pretty much my questions. Okay. Um, yeah. Did you have anything else you wanted to say? You were signed up. No, no, thank okay. you. Okay, all right. Um, okay, so this is uh, before us for introduction, and um, well, I'm sorry, what? Alderman. Uh, Burris asked that we hold it, yeah. right? Oh, okay. I, well, then I need a motion if you want to hold it in committee. I move that we hold it. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. And there's a second? Second. Okay. Second it. 
And could Alderman I ask, Wilson? Could I ask you another question? Sure, Alderman Wilson just turned his light on. Go ahead. We're holding it for what? Um, Alderman uh, Burris, who we've been working with uh, on this, has asked us to provide her some research about some some of the materials, how long it stays, what the uh, odors can be, that sort of thing. So we have, she's asked us to provide a little bit more homework for her. And we'll provide that to the committee, of course. And, and, and could we not add then also um, more details about the size of the bins and, and the operation hours, that kind of thing too? Uh, yeah, we can ask them what their proposal is, but again, it will be specified if they were to make a special use permit application, but yes, ma'am, we'll do that. Mm -hmm. Okay, that'll be held in committee then. Alderman Wilson, well, my, did you my, want to? I guess my, my comment was just going to be it'll, it'll give you guys an opportunity to kind of get together with the neighbors, get some more information out there so people better understand exactly what you're going to be doing and hopefully relieve some of the concerns and fears. Okay, we're moving on to P6 and P7. Uh, staff is requesting the removal of ordinances 1013 and 35013 from the agenda so that the P&D committee may consider a new ordinance regulating vacation rentals as a subset of bed and breakfast establishments at its meeting on May 13th, 2013. These agenda items were held in committee on April 1st, 2013. Uh, is there a motion to... Um, so move. Okay, everyone in favor? Aye. Uh, okay. Um, are there any items for discussion? Any, any communications? Uh, no, ma'am. Um, the last thing I want to say is um, a thank you to Steve Griffin. Mm. Who, uh, yeah, boo. <laughs> well, thank you for keeping me on my toes for two and a half years, too, planning yeah. a development Is committee. <laughs> yeah, so Steve is going on to bigger and how could anything be better than the city of Evanston? But it's warmer. yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh. so Steve, we will miss you. We thank you for everything that you've done for us and your good leadership. And um, thank you very much. It's been I an honor. Paying honor you a lot. It really is. <laughs> no, thank you so much. Okay, um, we're adjourned. City Council will begin in seven minutes. That's eight fifteen. <laughs>